I would like to say thank you very much to the Africa Center for Entrepreneurship and Youth Empowerment uh, for putting this very important um, event together. This lecture in memory of uh, Professor George Aite is very, very important. He came from Ghana. A lot of us who are not Ghanaian um, have benefited from you know, his understanding of markets in Africa and his you know, activism and his intellectual efforts to make sure that um, we as Africans generally you know, go back and see what worked and um, try to make, make change happen. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Emmanuel and, and his team for the invitation. So first I'll say today we embark on a journey of remembrance. Uh, we are honoring a titan whose legacy um, echoes across the continent and around the world um, and his name is Professor George Ayiti. As I take the stage today, um, the memories of my first encounter with uh, Professor George Ayiti's work, and they go back to 2010, when I was this restless undergraduate, uh, you know, I was curious about the future of my country. For those who know about Nigeria, there are a lot of challenges that we face. And despite the fact that I was in you know, the sciences, I studied animal physiology as my first degree, I understood that we needed to understand economics. You need to look into history if you are interested in making any change happen in your respective societies. So that made me explore um, economics to a certain extent outside of the normal curriculum that the school had. I wanted to live in a society where I did not have to fear the government. I have a, an experience, a lot of experiences with the government. I was just telling um, Dr. Palmer that I've had guns pointed at me six times with you know, threats to the threat to my life. None of these were, were by you know, criminals in a sense. It was like by state actors, policemen, soldiers. And that's the, that's the experience of a young Nigerian, especially a young Nigerian male. Um, and as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a reason of, as, because of that, I was a lot more curious about how to make that change happen in my society, since I saw the government from a very negative point of view. I found Professor's book, Professor Jodaiti's book. Um, the first book I, I, I found at the time was called Africa Unchanged. And like a puzzle, it sort of showed things that I did not, you know, I did not realize before. Um, it generated a foil, professors' works as well as works of other thinkers such as um, Bastiat and um, you know, authors that you know, promoted free, free trade or intellectual understanding of the situations in Africa. But professors' works stood out. It stood out to me and very quickly, uh, me and my friends uh, had this drive to establish a youth movement committed to propagating the principles of individual and economic freedom, a lot of the basis of our intellectual understanding and the arguments that we made were found in the works of Professor George Ayite. Fast forward to 2013, so this was in 2010. I find myself sharing a panel with um, the remarkable thinker, Professor George Ayite, at um, the Cato Institute in the US. And in his presence, you could almost sort of touch the wisdom that emanated from uh, from him and his unwavering support for young people in Africa. He represented intellectuals, people who had seen it in the academia, who had tussled with the government, who had tried to make change happen on that panel. And I represented the voice of the young people who were trying to learn, who are trying to find solutions to our future. Professor Ayite's work was not, it was not merely an academic. He was a torchbearer to freedom. He was relentless in the face of oppression. For those who know about him, he was, or his office was firebombed. He was very vocal about um, standing up to government. And he was an abinger of truth and Africa's innate strength. In spite of the numerous threats to his life, uh, he remained very resolute in his pursuit, uh, which is the pursuit of a free Africa. And that was the name of his foundation, the Free Africa Foundation. He consistently emphasized the narrative of Africa before colonialism, and he invited us to look to our past and look for solutions and things that worked then, and we don't just throw the baby with the bathwater. Today, we pay homage to his audacious visionary 
and reaffirm his commitment to empowering Africa's youth and charting a course towards a much more prosperous Africa. As we remember Professor Ayite today, and we celebrate him and his enduring courage, his unwavering dedication to liberty, and his unshakable faith in what he called the cheetah generation. If you've ever heard that term before, if you've ever heard or you've been called the cheetah generation, the first person, the person who coined that, that phrase, you know, was um, Professor Ayite. So in the next few minutes, we will sort of explore in, in Professor Ayite's uh, vision, his monumental contributions to the freedom of all of us, of all Africans, and of course, of all humans, and his profound impact on myself and many other African youth. This is not just a tribute to Professor Ayite, it's a call to action, and I'm urging us to rise and challenge the status quo, and to innovate and drive as Professor Ayite would have wanted us to. So as we delve deeper into the life and legacy of um, Professor Ayute, we find ourselves facing these portraits of this true visionary, a man whose dedication to the prosperity and the liberation of Africa was very, very strong. He wasn't just interested in seeing Ghana develop. Of course he was, and a lot of the things that he spoke about, he drew from experiences here in Ghana, but he didn't stay there. He also drew from experiences across other parts of the continent, and he used all of this in his scholarly work. He was a thinker, and above all, he was a fireless advocate for change, and I'm glad that we are here today to celebrate him. He spoke assertively about the adoption of free markets, which is why we have that on, you know, one, as part of the title today. And he, he urged us to hold our leaders accountable. He, so he spoke about economics, he spoke about governance, and he spoke about taking accountability as young people and as, as Africans generally. One of the key pillars of Professor Ayute's work was his belief in the strength of traditional African institutions. In his book, Indig Indigenous African Institutions, he argued very eloquently about the role of the extended family, which isn't something that many scholars talk about today. He talked about the village council. Now, we have village councils in Ghana, we have in Nigeria. It's a similar phenomenon that we see across the continent. And he also spoke about, you know, these rotating saving, savings and credit associations and their role in economic development. You have those here in, in Ghana, in Nigeria, we would call them Ajo. In some parts, they would call them Asusu. He saw before many, the blueprint for Africa's prosperity lay within the continent itself. And in one of his books, Africa in Chaos, Professor Ayute took us on a journey through history, revealing the factors that have contributed to Africa's current state. It was a call to arms. It was a call for us to wake up. And he urged us to learn from our past and look towards a better future. His strong belief in democracy and free markets was perhaps most notably expressed in his, in his book, Defending, uh, Defeating Dictators. He was very convinced that the power of these principles to bring about meaningful change continues to inspire and guide us today. He believed that we, as young people, would take the things that he's, talk, he's spoken about, the principles to hold our government accountable and would make, make our society sort of change. Professor Ayuti was not just a theorist. Now, I've spoken a lot about the books that he's written and the speeches that he's given, but he was an active participant in shaping minds. He was, he took a role in Students for Liberty, the organization that I work for, and was instrumental as a member of our advisory board. He provided guidance, wisdom, and most importantly, inspiration. He helped us shape and deliver a popular online course um, called Liberty in Africa, which has impacted thousands of students across the continent. And I invite you to explore that course. It's free for anyone who's interested in understanding freedom in Africa from various perspectives, from Nigeria, from Ghana, and from all over the continent. And of course, he was recognized while he was alive. Um, his commitment and his vision was recognized globally. He was awarded the Kwame Nkrumah Prize for Distinguished African Leadership, uh, the Freedom Prize for, from the Cato Institute, and on an honorary uh, doctorate degree, as, as well as many, many other degrees. But we, at Students for Liberty, where I work, 
and young people across the continent. We are very proud of what he was able to achieve in his lifetime. Um, in partnership with the Atlas Network, they are, we're distributing a book called Applied Economics for Africa, written by George Aite, which was his last book. I believe Tom will talk, talk a little bit about that um, in, in, his, in his lecture. But this book is a comprehensive introduction to the field of economics. Like I mentioned, I, my first degree was in animal physiology and I had nothing, I had very little understanding of economics. But if you are to change your society, if you are to make any meaningful change, whether it's in policy, whether it's holding government accountable, you need to understand economics to a certain extent. Now, you do not need to understand like the mathematical, theoretical, but you need to understand the principles of economics, of demand and supply, and why governments are making certain decisions. Unfortunately, many of the books that we have in our libraries today do not do justice. They do not explain economics to us. George Aite, before he died, changed that. He wrote a book that I think is a very, very important book for anyone who's interested in understanding economics. Who wants to know how, you know, how society works? And he made sure that the examples in these books were drawn from real life examples within an African context. So examples of IMF loans in Ghana, for ex you know, that's, that's an example, to um, government intervention in the Nigerian economy or in Botswana or in Ghana, so that you and I can really understand it. We saw a reflection in George Aite's work. He showed us that we should not just be inheritors of our past, while he, while he invited us to explore our past, he let us know that we should not just be inheritors of, the, of our past, but we should also be shapers of our future because we take the information that we learn about our past and what do we do with it? We use it to shape, shape our future. And he called us the, the Cheetah Generation. And the, the, the Cheetah Generation, as he fondly called us, um, he invited us to be beacons of hope uh, as we try to change our respective societies. So his physical presence has not dimmed the light that he lit while he was here. If anything, I think that that it has made us even more determined to carry on his legacy, which is one of the reasons why this event is happening. As we continue to draw vision from his vision and embody his values, I invite you to join us um, on, this, on this journey. So what exactly did Professor George Aite believe in while he was alive? What was his vision for change? I have tried to summarize, because he wrote so many books. He wrote dozens of books. But I've tried to summarize the crux of Professor Aite's arguments in very short paragraphs. Professor Ayute believed in the adoption of free market policies. He believed that free market policies were essential to, for economic development, in, not only in Africa, but around the world. His major focus, obviously, was Africa. Because they would lead to increased investments, increased in trade, and economic growth. He argued that these policies would create a much more level playing field for businesses and for people who we would naturally consider or normally consider not to be part of, you know, like the inform in the, who are in the informal sector. He believed that the free market policies would help to reduce corruption and rent seeking, which usually is, which, which is a major obstacle to economic development, not only in Ghana, but around the world. He was a firm believer in the promotion of democracy and that democracy was essential for political stability. I believe that we, it's, we would all agree with that. He argued that for us to practice democracy in Africa, we needed to look very look inward and look at the systems that existed before, colonial, before colonialism and look at traits and borrow from them rather than discard them. He argued that we must hold our leaders accountable. Professor Ayite believed that our African leaders needed to be held accountable for their actions because they had often used their power to enrich themselves and their cronies at the expense of their, their people. He argued for the rule of law and, and called every single one of us to not only hold our government accountable, but to understand what the value of the rule of law is. What is the rule of law? How does it work? What should, what tenets, what, what structures do we need to play, put in place to make sure that our societies are, are societies that respect the rule of law? 
He argued for all of these things and he called us to study, to understand our societies and to understand that we need to be the ones who will hold the government, our government accountable. He believed in the empowerment of women and that women play a vital role in Africa's development and in our democracy because they are made up of the majority of the population and often the backbone of the economy from the streets of Accra to the streets of Lagos or the streets of Nairobi, we usually overlook the many, many women who are there trading, who are actually the backbone of these different cities and these different, our, our societies. He believed that women and young people should be part of the decision-making process and that we should ensure that both women and young people have a voice. He argued a lot in many of his, many of his work for the use of traditional institutions like Nigeria, like Ghana, like Sierra Leone, like many of, these, many of these countries, we have traditional institutions that have flourished. We have the stools in Ghana, we have you know, the Obas or the Emias in Nigeria. And his argument was that we do not just disregard these traditional institutions that have existed before colonialism and make them just you know, honorary figures. He argued that these institutions such as our extended family, and it started from the extended family, and the extended family and the village council, that they, they had been there for centuries. And they've been there to sort of resolve disputes. Um, they've been there to sort of create cohesion amongst you know, um, certain villages. And they, ha they had their responsibilities. He understood that change would not happen overnight, uh, but he believed that it was possible if all Africans we are willing to work together. He believed very importantly in regional integration. Professor believed that Africa needed, needs to integrate more with its neighbors. Each country needs to integrate more with its neighbors in order to promote economic development. He argued that this would create a larger market for goods and services and to make it easier for businesses to operate across, you know, across the borders. I think that's a very, very important thing, and a lot of us are beginning to understand the importance of having like, freedom of movement across the continent. I, for one, have tried, if, if you're here and you've tried to travel from Ghana to Nigeria by road, you know how horrendous that is. It's very, very difficult, and I've tried that a few times, and I don't want to try it again until things change. Professor Ayute believed in the youth which I think is very, very important. He fondly called us the Jita generation. And he believed that the youth played a vital role in Africa's development. And he argued that the youth were the most dynamic and innovative part of the population. And I would agree. He used the term, the generation of young Africans, who he called us the generation of young Africans, who were tired of the status quo and were ready to take charge of their future. He believed that this generation, my generation, your generation, are more willing to take risks. And he called us to be agents of change in Africa and, and beyond. Aite was particularly concerned about the high levels of youth unemployment. And he argued that the youth unemployment was a major obstacle to economic development and that it could lead to social unrest. Yeah. And that could lead to social unrest. He called young people to take entrepreneurial action and take, take charge of their, of their lives. And I think that we are seeing a lot more young people getting more involved with you know, starting businesses and looking for um, means rather than working for the government. So I'd say we recall the unwavering faith that Professor Ayiti had in Africa's youth. His belief was not just in our potential, but also in our resilience and resolve to shape our future. His legacy is not just a series of writings and speeches. Instead, it's a generation, um, he believes that this generation will make change happen and we need to sort of take action. We not only draw inspiration from Professor Ayute's vision, but we also commit to carrying this button forward. And I invite you to do that. As we absorb his insights on liberty and free markets, we strive to instill these values in young, young Africans. I think it's the responsibility that we bear with pride and determination, that is vision the vision of a vibrant, dynamic Africa where liberty and prosperity thrives, that should be our guiding lights. And I invite every one of you to study, 
Professor Ayute's works. There are tons of them online. There are YouTube videos of him giving lectures. TED, there's a very brilliant TED talk that I invite you to sort of take. You'd find the fire and the passion that he has when he delivers his, his lectures to be very, very charming, to be very inviting. Because then it makes you think very critically about our states in our respective countries and what you can be doing to sort of make change happen. So let's join our hands, uh, join our minds, and join our hearts. And together we can achieve the dream that Professor Aite so fervently believed in, a free and prosperous Africa. Thank you. All right, a round of applause for him again, please. So, um, because of time, we would like to just go on quickly. If you have any questions, as far as um, it's okay to call you Olu, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, Olu's um, presentation, and I'd like to know so we get your questions passed to him. But before that, I'd like to start. So, there was a president in this country called Jerry Rollins, and he, he, he believed in something called um, an Africanized kind of democracy. Uh, in a certain YouTube video with, with, with an, with, in an interview to the West, he was strongly advocating a democracy that reflected Africa. I think somehow that's where he meets um, Professor Alote. Unfortunately, we haven't given chieftaincy a very, in my opinion, powerful role in our politics and democracy. Um, I don't know the situation in Nigeria, but um, what, what do you make of that entire um, situation? I think it's, that's a very important question. Now, and, and as you said, I think that's also very similar to the situation we have in Nigeria. So as we had coloni colonialism, um, the traditional institutions sort of were stripped of their responsibilities and the authority that they had. And that has continued progressively since, since then. Um, what Professor Ayute does is invite us to take a look at the parts of these kingships or chieftaincies, and, cause, and they are very elaborate, right, in, at, at least in Nigeria. And I, and I see pictures and I see videos here from Ghana as well. They are very elaborate, they are very elaborate structures that are just sitting down there, and individuals who, I'm not sure if, if in Ghana, if they are paid for by taxpayers, yeah, they get something, right? And, you know, we have these in, individuals who, we're not tapping into those structures or those institutions as much as we could, as much as we should. What we have done is we've looked to models in the US or to Europe and sort of adopted them hook, line, and sinker. Whereas we have this local knowledge, historians like an Oba, for example, in, from where I'm from, a king, he's an historian because he understands the context of the society, understands the implications of doing certain things in that society. But that knowledge is sort of lost because it's not part of the decision-making process it's not part of the governance structure in the country. And what Professor Ayute invites us to do is to look at these institutions and see how they can, we can have democracy involved. We did have something similar before. We had like the House of Chiefs in Nigeria, but that was very gradually sort of moved aside for um, a model of democracy that is entirely alien to us. Mm -hmm.